from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Amazon gets absolutely pummeled after predicting a rough holiday shopping season ahead. Shares falling more than 20% at one point, adding pain to an already hurting tech sector. Plus, Apple revenue beats estimates, but shares drop. The strong dollar and supply issues weighing on results. We're going to have all the details. And we are getting a glimpse into Elon Musk's vision for Twitter, including his hope to avoid a, quote, free-for-all hellscape. We're going to have more on how this could change your feed. All that in a moment, but first, a volatile day on the back of Meta's disappointing results and leading up to Amazon and Apple out after the bell. Our Ed Ludlow here to break it all down. Ed, lots of action today. Yeah, I mean, Em, you said it right. Amazon getting absolutely punished for the weakness in its fourth quarter forecast, the holiday quarter, of course. Its forecast for revenue significantly below what the street was looking for, 140 to 148 billion to come in the fourth quarter. The street was looking at 155.52 billion, but also the outlook for operating uh, income is weak, and that's putting it mildly. We've been saying all day on Bloomberg Television that companies in this earnings season either live or die by their outlook for what's to come in the final three months of this year. In comparison to other mega cap tech stocks, this is very weak. A mixed bag for Apple, down 1.3% in after hours, pairing some of its earlier losses. But what I would say is that it was the iPhone sales that came in weaker than expected, along with services. Overall, a beat on revenue and a beat on EPS in the quarter. But as you talked about this currency headwinds, and look at that power shares QQQ. It's the Invesco ETF, which tracks the NASDAQ 100. You're going to have to take my word for it, M. But being down 1.4% in after hours, that is a big move for this ETF that tracks the NASDAQ 100 so closely. So we look ahead to Friday's session where we expect those ripples in the market more broadly to be felt by what we're seeing in earnings season. Meta, the story of the day this Thursday, biggest drop uh, since February of this year, but the stock closing at, closing at its lowest level since January of 2016. The real concern, the growing expenses year on year into 2023, which uh, Meta outlined as being between 96 to $101 billion, the exact opposite of what investors have been calling on Mark Zuckerberg to do. And Twitter. Let's kind of end on a slightly more bright note, M. Twitter, we are inching closer and closer to the close of this deal. Kurt Wagner and I have reported in the last 10 minutes that Tesla engineering talent have been inside Twitter's San Francisco headquarters this Thursday, evaluating and assessing the underlying code which powers the Twitter platform to help Elon Musk understand it. There have been meetings, what they called code pairing, where you sit down and work on it together. But all the signs from both sides, the debt side and the equity financing side, and what I I'm hearing from sources. We'll get a close of this deal Friday as expected. All right, Ed Ludlow, thank you. Great reporting. Uh, I want to dig in further to those Amazon results. Shares tumbling in late trading due to a holiday quarter forecast that came in well below expectations. Rachel Tipograph is the CEO and founder of Micmac, an e-commerce platform that helps big brands grow. Joining us now to unpack these results. So not a warm and fuzzy outlook for Amazon this holiday shopping season. Rachel, what's your take on these results? Is this inflation? Is this a broader downturn looming? Macroeconomic factors are impacting everyone at play. At the end of the day, net sales for Amazon did increase by 15%, which was in range with what Amazon executives were expecting, but not what the street wanted. I think a big focus was focusing on what would happen during the first ever prime early access event that happened in October. Over 100 million items were sold. So all of a sudden, Amazon was able to move excess inventory. It also showed that despite inflation, consumers were ready to shop as long as it was about value and convenience. What we saw at Micmac is that the categories that performed strongest during the sale event were health, personal care and grocery, not necessarily consumer electronics toys. So what this continues to show is that consumers are willing to spend, but spend on necessities. So it sounds like you're a little more optimistic than the typical doom and gloom forecast that we've been hearing that said on the back of you know, not so great results from Microsoft, Alphabet, Meta. Could it all get worse than we think? 
So I actually think that Amazon is in a very unique position to eat those other companies' lunch. And the reason why <laughs> is if you look at Amazon's advertising business in this past quarter, it actually grew over 25%. It's now the third largest player in advertising in the US. This is significant. And the reason why is that changes in iOS 14 cookie-less internet that negatively impacted Alphabet and Meta are actually benefiting Amazon. Amazon has so much first-party data and they own their DSP and they built out self-serve capabilities that cater to the small medium businesses. They're in a position right now to significantly grow their advertising business, which has incredible margins, which can offset losses in other parts of the business, while platforms like Alphabet and Meta are struggling. How is this impacting the brands that you work with? And obviously you help them grow their businesses in part with the, you know, the help of Amazon and other big e-commerce companies. Yeah, I mean, we work with huge consumer packaged good companies. And these companies understand that during trying economic times, you cannot stop spending. You can look at Procter & Gamble. You can look at Coca-Cola. Over their 100-year history, they always spend during trying times, and they always come out ahead. That being said, CFOs at those organizations want every single dollar to be able to work really hard. And that's why Amazon is in a unique position with its advertising business during this time because it has really, really strong return on investment. And so right now, what we're seeing across Fortune 1000 consumer packaged good companies is that if they have a dollar to spend, they're often moving it into environments like retail media where there's guaranteed ROI. You have some interesting thoughts about buy now, pay later, and how that might have made uh, the current uh, consumer uh, situation worse. Can you share that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at 2020 and 2021, which honestly within commerce are anomaly years, we always guide our customers to look at 2019. That's a much more realistic comp. But in 2020 and 2021, many consumers were trained to essentially spend money that they don't have. As interest rates have risen, all of a sudden, consumers are recognizing that that buy now, pay later value proposition will put them in major debt and cost them so much. And so I share this because there was a lot of fake money that was being spent in the ecosystem. And if you remove that, all of a sudden, very quickly, you'll start to see trends that look more like 2019. And so in the long run, I actually think this is going to be benefit consumers because hopefully it'll prevent them from going into deeper debt or debt at altogether. All right, uh, Rachel, Tipograph founder and CEO of Micmac. Uh, really interesting insights from you. Thank you uh, for sharing all of that with us. Sticking with Amazon, the National Labor Relations Board says CEO Andy Jassy violated federal labor laws when he told me this about workers earlier this year. We happen to think they're better off without a union for a number of reasons, um, including the fact that, you know, it's, it's much harder uh, when you have a union to have a direct relationship with your manager and to get things done quickly. The complaint against Jassy follows a number of big tech union votes from workers across the country. In a statement, Amazon says the comments lawfully explain Amazon's views on unionization and the way it could affect the ability of our employees to deal directly with their managers. And they began with a clear recognition of our employees' right to organize and in no way contain threats of reprisal. Meantime, got to dig into Apple results now. The tech giant posting weaker than expected iPhone and services sales in its latest quarter. Julie Osk, principal analyst at, at Forrester Research, with us now. So, Julie, why are investors so uh, seemingly unhappy with this report? I think it's, it's hard for me to say why investors are seemingly so unhappy with this report. Um, but I think one of the things, you know, that I look at more broadly is, you know, it's it's their, you know, it's not the big quarter. Um, you know, they got product out, even though consumers could order products, there were still a lot of delays in shipping products. 
Uh, they just announced a new tablet lineup last week. So I think, you know, the third quarter, whatever, you know, that quarter is going to be what it's going to be. But I think, you know, it's really important for every consumer electronics manufacturer is, you know, the holiday season. And that's what we've got to look forward to. And that's, you know, what's most important for them the rest of the year. So uh, let's talk about that. Uh, some words from Tim Cook here. He says, as we head into the holiday season with our most powerful lineup ever, we're leading with our values in every action we take and every decision we make. We're deeply committed to protecting the environment, securing user privacy, strengthening accessibility, and creating products and services that can unlock humanity's full creative potential. When you look at the product lineup, what's available this holiday season, the way that they're keeping, you know, many of the prices the same, how optimistic are you that they're going to be able to move a lot of product? So, you know, I do have some optimism. We just put out, uh, Forrester just put out their holiday forecast, and we're uh, predicting, we're forecasting an increase in online spend of about 14.6%. Uh, when we've surveyed consumers, we have 18% of consumers saying they're going to spend more this year than last year. Uh, on the flip side, we still have about 40% saying that they're going to spend less. Uh, when we talk to consumers about how they're feeling about the economic headwinds, uh, we do have, you know, depending on the question that you ask, between like 39 and 41 percent of U.S. online consumers saying, I'm delaying making purchases. Um, I am worried about the economy. I, there are things that I'm going to pull back on. Um, and then, you know, and just not making purchases they want to make. And then if you ask them just kind of the sentiment of how they're doing, there's probably about 50 percent of them that are worried about the economy, worried about their money, and definitely, you know, expect to slow down purchasing this holiday season. So I think it's, you know, going to be a question of, you know, what is that mix? You know, is that 18 percent the affluent 18 percent that Apple relies on year in and year out? Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's still going to be a good holiday season, but it may not be what everybody wanted it to be. You know, if we were to look at the forecast from earlier in the year, it's going to be a tough season. Meantime, China. China has historically been a huge market for Apple. Tim Cook was really the architect of Apple's China strategy. And we're in the middle of a, of a, of a potentially history-making decoupling of the U.S. and China. How is Apple handling that? And how much will that impact or potentially hurt Apple over the longer term? Yeah, so I think that's always a hard question, Emily, because I think always, you know, the devil is in the details. I think one of the things that's been interesting about watching China from a consumer standpoint, which is closer to what I follow, is the Chinese are still far more locked down than we are here in the United States and than we are in Europe. And so there is more consumption of, um, you know, online media, virtual worlds. We're seeing far more interest in things like the metaverse uh, and, you know, and streaming media and things that keep them entertained at home. So I think it's, it's, it's hard for me to say, you know, Know what's going to happen in China, but it's a very different environment that we have here in the U.S. in terms of, like I said, our mobility and how much we're depending on media and electronics and so forth to keep us entertained, to continue to work, you know, stay in touch with our friends and family and so forth. So it'll be interesting to watch. Uh, meantime, I have to ask you about the controversy, uh, changes in, in Apple's ad tracking policies, Meta hitting back this week with how much it's hurting them and other social media companies. You've got the skeptics and the critics out there saying that Apple isn't doing this to protect privacy or, or security, but to add to Apple's own bottom line. What's your take? So, you know, there's there's a little bit of both, but I don't know that anyone's crying for, um, you know, Apple or Google's diminished ability to monetize the data of consumers, right? Those companies have grown very, very wealthy over the past couple of decades by doing so. And I think as we look forward and we're looking at the values that consumers have, you know, Tim Cook really hits on them one after the other. It is about our privacy. It is about security. It is about responsibility. It is about the environment. Uh, it is about trust. And if we look at some of the biggest themes that our clients are asking about, it's all of those. It's trust. It's the economy. It's the green, you know, it's being green. It's security. It's privacy and so forth. And I think that's really the long game. Uh, do I think that advertising is going to contribute in a substantial way to Apple's bottom line in the next five years? Um, I'd be surprised if they break out that revenue. I'd be surprised if it gets to be that big. Hmm. This is about right. Apple. Uh, Julia. <laughs> right, right. I understand. Uh, well, always great to hear from you, Julie, uh, Vice President, Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. Thank you so much for stopping by. We're listening in to the Apple conference call. We'll bring you more headlines as we have them. Coming up, Musk's message to Twitter advertisers and what we're hearing about his visit to the company headquarters. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
Elon Musk has both tried to acquire and walk away from acquiring Twitter. Here's how we got here. April 4th, a regulatory filing reveals that Elon Musk has rapidly become the largest Twitter shareholder. April 14th, in an SEC filing and accompanying tweet, Musk says he will buy out stockholders in a cash deal and take Twitter private. The offer, valued at $43 billion, is a 54% premium over the price in January. May 17th, after Musk and Twitter CEO Parag Agrawal have it out on Twitter, Musk tweets he won't proceed unless Twitter can prove bots are less than 5% of its users. July 8th, Elon Musk backs out of the deal, saying in a filing that Twitter made misleading representations over the bots issue. July 12th, Twitter sues Musk to force him to complete the deal. Musk countersues. October 4th, after a trove of Musk's inner circle texts are revealed in court filings, Musk revives his bid at the original offer price, potentially avoiding a courtroom fight. October 6th, the Delaware Chancery judge pauses the court case, giving the parties more time to complete a deal. A 5 p.m. October 28th hard deadline is set, otherwise the trial resumes in November. To some of the Musk Twitter saga there that we've been living through for most of the year, but finally this deal seems imminent. In a tweet addressed to advertisers, Musk said he wants to make Twitter a welcoming town square with highly relevant ads and less of a, quote, free-for-all hellscape. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Sarah Fryer. And Sarah, our latest reporting is that Tesla engineers have gone to Twitter headquarters to review some of Twitter's code and also that Twitter's code has been frozen ahead of a pending deal so no changes can be made at the 11th hour. What's the latest that we know? Well, it looks to us from our sources that these Tesla engineers are meant to review the code to help Elon Musk assess it and think about what needs to be done. Um, you know, companies that have been around for as many years as Twitter has, their their code can always be confusing to newcomers. So he's bringing in some trusted fellow uh, folks from his companies he he also runs. Um, and and then just in terms of the the note to advertisers this morning, I, I think that Elon Musk is is trying a little bit of. Um, a reversal of what what has been said out there about what he's going to do. I mean, we all know he has this free speech plan for Twitter. What that's going to mean is is loosening up a lot of the moderation standards and bringing on content that could make advertisers uncomfortable. So I'm not exactly sure how he's going to do both things at once. As I wrote um, today for our quality newsletter, you, you can't have a commercially viable social network, one that advertisers want to, to buy promotions on, one that people want to join without some level of content moderation. There has to be some line that he's he's going to draw and he's going to have to figure out what kind of balance he is comfortable with. How are Twitter employees feeling about this? We know he was at headquarters yesterday. There's this picture uh, that was posted of everyone gathered around him. Some people were smiling. It didn't look so, you know, potentially doom and gloom. Of course, you only can get a few <laughs> few people in one photo. Um, but how are Twitter? How are Twitter employees feeling about this? Given that he said, you know, there's reports that he might cut up to 75 percent of the workforce. He's bringing in engineers from another company to look at their code. Well, we, we skipped last night that he actually told Twitter employees that he does not plan to cut 75% of the staff. In fact, he, he claims he doesn't know where that number came from. Of course, you know, as we previously reported, it came from his own presentations to equity investors. So I think that there's just a lot of, of, of the putting down the hatchet and the, all of this tension between months of court fights between Twitter and Elon Musk, you know, coming to a place where they can work together, where he can work with their partners and advertisers, where he's saying basically, I come in peace, you know, I, I am, I am going to be the boss here, and and I'm going to care about this, and, and he's come, he comes in with this this perspective, or at least he says in his letter to advertisers that he's doing this for humanity, right? This is a very grandiose vision for what Twitter can be under his watch, um, and I think that 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 kind of messaging actually does appeal to Twitter employees. That they tend to say that you know, when you talk to them, they're in it for for the impact you can have on the world and our culture and our, our um, you know, politics, like, you know, they can make a difference. So I, I think that is historically why people have joined Twitter and, and not maybe some other bigger tech companies that might pay them better. I, so it'll be interesting to see if, if Musk can 
can actually come in peace, even though he's certainly going to have to change quite a bit. He's going to have to cut staff and um, dramatically pivot the company in his vision. So he's in there talking to employees. He's walking around with the kitchen sink. <laughs> Give us the TikTok of the next 24 hours. When does this deal get sealed? I mean, we're already reporting that Arch Capital is going to replace Twitter in the S&P 500. It, it's really a, a matter of time before the shares stop trading on um, on the open market. That that will be our our first public signal, perhaps, that the deal is done. Um, we are also looking at filings that might happen in Delaware. They they need uh, whatever is being signed right now. It's not final until you know. It's like when you buy a house, it's not final until you get the keys. All these little steps have to be done before we can say the deal is closed. Um, but it, it looks very much on track right now. Um, there are unlikely to be, I, I say this with the grain of salt, right? <laughs> this has been quite the saga, but they're unlikely to be stumbling blocks between now and 5 p.m. on Friday um, Eastern time, which is when the judge in Chancery Court says this, this needs to be completely complete by, she wants an email in her inbox by 5 p.m. saying, it's, it's done. We don't need to go to court. All right. Well, some people might not be getting some sleep tonight, and I hope one of them is not you, Sarah Fryer, our Bloomberg Tech editor. Thank you so much. We're going to be right back with more of Bloomberg Technology after this break. This is Bloomberg. Microsoft is out with its first ever report on median pay for its workforce. It shows that women do better than the U.S. average, but black and Hispanic employees remain underrepresented in higher level roles. And Microsoft's employees of color overall make less. Tesla facing a criminal investigation into its self-driving system. Bloomberg has learned that the U.S. Justice Department is investigating whether the company made misleading claims about Tesla cars' ability to drive themselves. Dow Jones reporting the SEC is probing Tesla as well. Coming up, what does the consumer want in this inflationary environment? We're going to be talking about more earnings with Shopify's Harley Finkelstein. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get back to the after hours action. Apple and Amazon. Back to Ed Ludlow. And Ed, Apple investors seem to like what they're hearing from Tim well, Cook they, on this call. They were liking what they were hearing from Tim Cook, but then Luca Maestri started speaking and they did not like that. The stock at one point up 2% now after hours, then dropping suddenly. It seems to be the headlines crossing that they're not giving revenue guidance because of the uncertainty in the world and the macro picture. Total company revenue growth will decelerate compared to the fourth quarter, the fiscal fourth quarter. And the forecast here is that Mac revenue will decline substantially in the holiday quarter. Those are not things that the market like. You see Apple now down by 2.6%. There was a pocket of strength in this earnings season for Apple, which was the MacBook. Executives saying that a lot of buyers of the MacBook were first time buyers. Perhaps that's because of the cutting edge technology. This is what Tim Cook had to say about that. Our Mac customers have already been raving about the power of M2 since the arrival of our newest MacBook Air and MacBook Pro this summer. Their incredible long battery life, stunningly rich display, and lightning fast speeds are a signature part of the Mac experience and help drive an all-time record revenue for Mac during the September quarter. So that's the story of Apple so far. We'll continue to bring the latest as it crosses the Bloomberg. Really, the story of Amazon, we know that the investor base is not impressed with this outlook for the fourth quarter. How often, Em, have you ever heard Amazon say that macroeconomic conditions are tough? That seems like a card you play when earnings are not very good. Hat tip to editor Nick Turner for that one. An interesting bright spot in After Hours, though, Intel. It's actually a little uh, kind of bastion of hope in the sense it's up 3%. 
revenue was not good, numbers not great, but there's basically a pledge from the company to cut costs, be financially uh, disciplined, get this company back on track, and investors seem to be buying the story with that stock higher almost 4% in after hours. We'll keep an eye on that one too. All right, Ed Ludlow, thank you. I want to dig in now to Shopify's results, kind of bucking the trend with shares rising over the last couple of days after uh, their uh, numbers came out. Shopify president Harley Finkelstein with us now. So, Harley, how did you manage to buck the trend here? You know, what is it that Shopify is doing that everyone else ain't? Uh, thanks for having me, Emily. Uh, you know, we're, we are happy with how things came out. I, I think the big thing that, uh, the big takeaway is that the role that Shopify is playing in the lives of the millions of merchants is, is just not of a typical software company. One of the things that I mentioned on the call quite a bit was this merchant um, mer merchant services attach rate. And that is really uh, the amount of services and value that we create for, for merchants. And I think the big difference here is we're not just the e-commerce provider anymore. We're the retail partner for physical retail. We're their capital partner. We've given out now more than $4 billion of cash value and loans to our merchants, we're their logistics partner. And with audiences, Shopify audiences, we're now their advertising partner in some cases too. And so we saw a 2.14% merchant solutions attach rate in Q3. That's up from 1.98 in Q2. So that was really good. On the revenue side, you know, revenue came in 1.4 billion. That's up 22% year on year. And on a three-year CAG rate, it's about 52%. But I also think what the street and investors wanted to see was, was operating discipline. And we saw adjusted gross profit of 600, over $680 million that's up 11% and a three-year CAGR of 46%. So when they see that plus year-on-year -year declining operating expense growth and $5 billion of cash in the balance sheet, I think they see that Shopify is a long-term durable company. Investors are looking at this as potentially uh, a sign that Shopify's worst days are behind it, quote unquote, it's been a tough year. You've had job cuts. It's a very tough retail environment. Inflation is weighing on everyone. Would you agree with that? Is is the worst over? Look, I think Shopify was this incredible COVID, you know, s story. Uh, March 2020, physical retail shuts down permanently, and all these physical retailers end up moving to needed to move online, and most of them did so with Shopify. I think what most people missed was that the trust we build in the COVID period meant that now that stores are reopening, physical stores are reopening, they're now using us to to replace their existing point of sale systems as well. So that's one issue. The second issue is that you know, talking about sort of the macro trend of the consumer. This idea of omni-channel, we've talked, I've talked about this on your show before, this is now steady state. The best brands, the most modern brands, they need to sell everywhere, online, offline, on social media, on marketplaces, and doing so with the retail operating system like Shopify gives them the tools to do so. So I, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of the, the larger economy in, in the future, but certainly, you know, September was a good month from a consumer spend. It looks like October was pretty good too, but our, our, our merchants, the millions of merchants on Shopify are getting set up for a good holiday season, and we want to be there to support them on that. Uh, you know, investors were not happy with Amazon's results. Their holiday forecast was not great. Uh, you know, what's what's your read on that and what it also could bode for Shopify? <laughs> I mean, we're certainly dealing with you know, an inflationary economy right now. There's no doubt about that. What I what I what I think is 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 certain is that the direct to consumer business model, where brands manufacture and sell direct to the consumer, where there are no intermediaries, there is more margin there. There is more room for inflation, and so I actually think that that a direct to consumer model operates better in this environment than say a third party reseller might, who's already operating on on razor thin margins. But so far, I mean, you know, you you look at companies uh, just this quarter, glossy for example, or Spanx, for example, or Allo Yoga, or uh, Viore, for example, like th these these brands on Shopify are doing really, really well. And so, you know, we, we we think the consumer remains strong, but we'll see what the holiday season comes from. Most important thing, though, is that we're there to support them no matter what they want to do. You had me at Viore, Harley. Love it. Great I'm brand. Still buying. Great um, brand. Great story. <laughs> let's talk about your <laughs> logistics and fulfillment network. Obviously, uh, you've been developing that. Where does development stand now, and what are your ambitions there when it comes to investing and you know potential acquisitions? Yeah, we've made a lot of progress there. I mean, the goal is to build an end-to-end -end logistics network. So from the second your product is made at the factory to to when your your consumer gets it, we want to basic we want to handle that for for all of our merchants. The key though is that we want to make it so that when you use Shopify 
uh, for Shopify Fulfillment Network, when you use our logistics uh, product, you don't have to think about logistics. But the key here is something that I mentioned on the earnings call today. It's called Shop Promise. This idea that when you use our fulfillment product, you can provide an anticipated delivery date with certainty to your consumer. In early testing of, of Shop Promise, we know that consumers will spend more, they will convert higher when they know when to anticipate it. So we're not trying to build out what Amazon did, this like one day free shipping thing. What we're trying to do is make it so that our merchants, one, don't have to think about logistics. It's not a problem for them. We'll take care of it. And second, that they can provide an, anticip an anticipation of when the product will get into the hands of consumers. And we've made a lot of progress there. So when that, you know, we, we've uh, disclosed a partnership that we have with Flexport on that first phase from factory to port. From port to fulfillment, we acquired a company called Deliver that does balancing better than, frankly, anyone on the planet. And that third phase, from the fulfillment center to the end consumer, that's really where Shopify Fulfillment Network takes uh, really ramps up. And 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 we have partners, you know, all over the U.S. right now that are using our software, our robotics technology from Six River System, and we are creating this 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 logistics uh, network. And and we've made a lot of progress. We'll continue to do so. But the key really is the shop promise to give everyone, every small business, the same tools that, frankly, Amazon has with things like you know, Amazon Prime, and, and we think we can do that. That said, in-person shopping is back, and I can imagine back even bigger this holiday season. How is Shopify prepared to adapt to that, or, and, are, and what are you planning for? Yeah, so it, 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 you're 100% you're correct. It, it, it is back. Um, it is, I mean, it went away, obviously, during the pandemic, but, you know, we always believe the future retail is going to be retail everywhere. It'll be about consumer choice. The consumer may want to buy online or offline or on Instagram or Snap or TikTok or, you know, in person. So those are the tools that we've been building. What you saw in this past quarter was we saw a 35% increase year on year of GMV on point of sale. At the same time, we're seeing larger merchants replace their entire point of sale systems with Shopify whether it's Aloe Yoga or it's James Purse, my favorite brand, but also this quarter alone, more than eight, excuse me, eight retailers with more than 25 locations replaced their existing traditional point of sale systems with Shopify. We actually had one merchant of ours who replaced us in 175 locations. So we really are scaling up around Shopify, we call point of sale pro to help larger retailers with lots of stores really replace and, and modernize their, their in-store experience. But the idea is this, if you are a consumer and you buy something online and then you go into a store a week later, they should have the same information. It's one set of information, one set of customer data, one set of inventory. That this, like The idea of omni-channel, I think, is going to become like talking about the color TV in a few years from now. You don't say color TV because every TV is fundamentally color TV. That's what omni-channel will be. The best retailers that are most successful will be omni-channel by default in the future. All right, Shopify president Carly Finkelstein it should be should uh, will certainly be an eventful holiday season. That at least we can say thank you. Hope to come. Coming up, we are seeing a decoupling between crypto and stocks. Why? We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. Ethereum is transitioning to low energy consumption at a time of crisis, which could and maybe should turn in turn bump up demand and adoption. Bloomberg Shanali Basik joins us now from New York to explain. Do explain, Shanali. <laughs> yeah, because it's interesting. It's not even just the energy usage here, Emily, you're seeing. There's a lot of questions on what the merge really did for Ethereum. And the reason we have to look at it is, are people trading Ethereum more on the fundamentals, more than they are the macro story? And the answer is, if you look at it since the merge, it's about flat to down. But in the last month period, one month period, it is up nearly 15%. It is up pretty significantly over a seven-day period. So you are seeing some positive impacts here on Ethereum when it comes to pricing here. One of those reasons is that people believe that there is a more deflationary impact when it comes to Ethereum. That means supply is somewhat more pressured here, which would have an impact on the pricing. Now, Bloomberg Intelligence also has more information about Ethereum. They're really positive on the uh, trends here in terms of usage over the longer term. Remember, 
remember, the reason I bring this up, Emily, is because when I talk to my sources, not just in crypto, but in the banking industry, they're watching Ethereum really closely on what it could mean in terms of, you know, the next cryptocurrency that could really help form a backbone to the financial system. So the more you see Ethereum succeed, the more you see more traditional players also be more comfortable with the network itself. Now, I think we should also kind of turn our attention here to kind of what this means for the broader network. I know we're going to talk about this in a second here, but, you know, the idea here that people are trading more on fundamentals and less on the macro story, I think, is really important to a lot of large investors. And there are some questions about how that is starting to form in the market, uh, especially as you're seeing some more macro hiccups come to the forefront and inflation be as sticky as it is. Bitcoin had a couple of strong sessions earlier this week. It's back above 20. And yet, you know, we've had, you know, several guests on this show uh, saying it's going to go down to 12 or 13. You know, is it really decoupled <laughs> from the rest of the market? Is this just a blip? It, the reason that it's important to watch this at this point, to your point, it's held above 20,000. It's faced a little bit of pressure in the last 24-hour period. But again, that 20,000 level is a psychological level. It's an important level to hold on. When you talk to folks that were surveyed by, uh, by Bloomberg, hundreds of people, they really say that it's not going to break in or out of a very large range. 12,000 uh, would be lower than that range. So if you do see a drop to that point, then you do have a lot more psychological issues when it comes to trading Bitcoin, especially barring any large leveraged event like you saw earlier this year with Three Arrows or anybody else. So to your point, if it were to fall that much, it would be concerning. But I think you also have to take note that you saw massive tech firms report earnings that were very disappointing. Pointing, yet Bitcoin holds up generally in the face of that when Bitcoin has been trading correlated to the NASDAQ for a while. I'll refer back to Dan Moorhead in a note that he put out with Pantera just a couple of days ago and that crypto has really traded a very low correlation to the S&P for most of its life. But in the last eight months, it was very correlated to the NASDAQ. And he says that there are uh, risk assets struggling, but there is a world where blockchain does well and the S&P S&P was down, gold was down, treasuries were down, and the Galaxy Crypto Index was up 7.3% in that same time frame. So again, near-term signs of decoupling, does it hold, is the main question for the market. All right. Bloomberg Shanali Basik, as always, appreciate it. Coming up, more earnings overstock. We're going to talk about that and more with its CEO, John Johnson, with us next. This is Bloomberg. More earnings today, including overstock, missing estimates in the midst of rising inflation. Want to dig into the numbers and e-commerce trends with Jonathan Johnson, the CEO of Overstock. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. So earnings beat, but we saw revenue drop more than 30 percent. What is driving this? Is it inflation? Is it, is it uh, this pending downturn? Well, I think it's a lot of things. I think it's a uh, lapping pandemic numbers where we grew really well. It's a very promotional environment. Uh, many of our competitors are have too much inventory and are working to liquidate that. That makes the environment more difficult. And of course, there's inflation and rising interest rates. When interest rates rise, housing sales go down. That, of course, of course hurts our business as a home furniture retailer. So lots going into it. I think the good news is even with all that headwind, Overstock is profitable for its 10th consecutive quarter. We've got a very asset light business model that works when the jolts help us and that works when the jolts are against us. How is Overstock responding? There's some criticism that growth in advertising is sort of overshadowing bread and butter retail on the website and that there are too many promos. Boy, you know, I, I think... Uh, in a highly promotional market uh, where competitors uh, are holding more and more sales, uh, we have to be there. Our, our view is we're always going to provide smart value to our customer, which means the best product they can afford for the amount of money they're spending, really quality product. Uh, we promote. Uh, we are also in the middle of launching 
a new marketing campaign that associates our brand more with home. We are a 100% home furniture and home furnishings company. Uh, we've got a new ad out that's entitled, Come On, Get Comfy. We've got social media uh, brand ambassadors that have just signed on, really pushing our mobile app. So there's a lot of marketing to try and push overstock, overstock sales that are not just promotions. Let's talk a little bit about the broader landscape, though. Amazon stock was pummeled today, not a, not a bright forecast for the holiday quarter. I'm curious what you make of that and if you're ex, you know, expecting to, to feel similar trends. Well, look, I think uh, it's a very competitive market uh, in a tough economy. And, uh, you know, our top line sales were down year over year significantly. We're not pleased with that. But I think it's incumbent upon all businesses when that happens to manage to the bottom line and make sure you're profitable. The way I view today's economy, it's like we're hiking down into the Grand Canyon and we're going to have a long hike up at some point. In order to hike up that North Rim, every hiker needs energy and fuel. And for a retailer, that need means you need lots of inventory and a strong balance sheet. Overstock has both. I think that bodes well for us in the future. Let's talk about your inventory because you've been diversifying your products and I'm curious how well that's working out. You know, for example, when, when Amazon uh, diversified into more products, return rates went up, they're now a machine at accepting returns. Are you getting more returns and how would you say your return operation compares? We've actually been focusing. We went from being a general merchandiser and over six quarters, we got rid of everything that wasn't related to home. So we're really a furniture and home furnishings company. During the last three years, we have doubled the amount of home product we have on site. And that doesn't mean tens or hundreds of thousands more. It means millions of more products. Uh, we have always been good at managing returns on home furniture and furnishings, a difficult thing to do. And we think it's one of the characteristic that sets us apart. We are all about easy delivery and support for our customers. They know that if they buy something for us, they're going to have a good experience on the back end. It's going to be delivered well and on time. And if for any reason they want to return it, we're good at facilitating that return. And we're getting even better through a partnership we're piloting with UPS right now. Give us a status update on supply chain issues. Is is the worst behind us? How are those going to be felt through the holiday quarter? First off, I think most retailers are flush with inventory. We're flush with inventory too. So that, that piece of the supply chain is not a concern. If customers are worried about getting product on time for the holidays, if you come to our site and you push click to order, we're pack packing and shipping that day or the next. So there's no worries there. I think on the supply chain front, uh, stuff being manufactured overseas, that supply chain is running fairly smoothly. Container costs have gone way down. The ports aren't clogged like they were before. The place where there are still supply chain constraints is from the distribution center uh, to the customer. And that's mostly in costs are more expensive because of higher fuel, uh, more accessorial surcharges. That means it's either being passed on to the customer or, in our case, often eaten as part of our gross margins. So what are going to be the most popular items this holiday season? Sounds well, like I tell you, you've got a I lot tell of you, inventory and it's going to get to folks on time. <laughs> we got a lot of inventory. One place that we're particularly deep are uh, giftable products. We've got lots of uh, home appliances, big brand names like KitchenAid, uh, Mr. Coffee, uh, Cuisinart. Uh, these tend to be highly giftable items. We've got lots of them. The other products that have been selling well recently are things to do with home improvement. As home sales are down and people realize they're staying in their home and they want to spruce it up, we've been selling lots of home okay. improvement products, things like bathroom vanities. All right. Some gift ideas, too, uh, that I hadn't thought of. Jonathan Johnson, CEO of Overstock. Thank you so much, uh, for joining us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Coming up Friday, we've got Ross Gerber. He will be talking about Elon Musk and more, of course, a big Tesla 
investor who wasn't such a fan of Twitter. And of course, we'll give you an update on the deal. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.